program. Now, the U.N. has imposed sanctions on Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi and his inner circle, freezing assets and restricting international travel. It comes as violence continues to ravage the divided country in what's been the bloodiest of the uprisings in the Arab world. For the latest developments, we're joined now by our correspondent in the region, Peter Oliver. Peter, there's no easing of the situation in Libya as we can see. So what more do we know about what's happening there at the moment? Well, the very latest is the sanctions that you mentioned. These have been unanimously voted in by the UN Security Council. As he mentioned, they'll take the place of an asset freeze, uh, a ban on travel, an arms embargo, and also they will refer Colonel Gaddafi to an international criminal court for crimes against humanity. Now, that's a crucial topic that was, uh, that was passed by the UN Security Council on Saturday. Now, over the past seven days, we've seen violence flare across Libya. Um, now the, the protesters, the, the anti-Gaddafi forces, if you will, are in control of the majority of the country. Now, they have their main foothold, their base was the city of Benghazi in the east of Libya. That From there, they cut a swathe across the country, toppling uh, Gaddafi forces in all major cities apart from the capital, Tripoli. Now, we're hearing that inside the capital, Tripoli, that uh, Gaddafi forces, pro-Gaddafi forces, have been handing out weapons to civilians and that the majority of the citizens of, of, um, of Tripoli are remaining indoors inside their homes in order to avoid gangs of, of civilians that have been armed, who have been setting up checkpoints there. So there's a lot of violence continuing in the country. We've also heard some, some troubling audio commentary that came out of Tripoli from... Um, a, a lady who was inside the city. Now, this came after Friday prayers where Colonel Gaddafi delivered a message to his supporters in the country. The protesters, the anti-Gaddafi protesters, then took to the streets. They were fired at by uh, Gaddafi forces, apparently killing many people there. The number of dead expected to be well over a 1,000 in Libya. And the worry, the most troubling audio described... Uh, a story of protesters fleeing to their homes being pursued by gunmen so, so that they could be killed inside their own homes. Also, stories coming out that we can't exactly confirm just yet, but we are hearing from protesters that um, the bodies of the dead are being buried very, very quickly to cover up the atrocities that have been taking place in the country. Now, Prime Minister, Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin made a comment on the situation there and across the whole of the Arab world, suggesting that these countries that have had revolutions must be allowed to determine their own future. Today, we say we're concerned about things happening in Libya. Please note the following. The North African cell of Al-Qaeda is also concerned about what is happening in Libya. Do you think this is a coincidence? I'd like to go back in history a little bit. The former leader of the Iranian Revolution, where did he live? He lived in Paris. And as a whole, he was supported by the Western community. Now the entire Western community fights against the Iranian nuclear program. I remember just recently our partners were very active in supporting democratic elections in the Palestinian autonomy, and Hamas won. And immediately they declared Hamas a terrorist organization and started fighting against it. We need to give people a chance to determine their future themselves. We need to give them an opportunity to take a natural way, without any foreign interference, to build their future. Peter, as we know, anti-government protests have been raging elsewhere in the region throughout the week. Talk us through what's been going on there. Well, that's right. We have seen some violent protests across the region. In Iraq on Friday, there was uh, extremely violent demonstrations taking place in many cities across the country against the current regime, the current government there. In, um, in Bahrain, it has continued as well. The most violent we've seen, the, the largest flare-ups seem to have been in the, uh, and, sorry, I beg your pardon, Yemen also suffering problems with, uh, with violence on the streets and protests. But if we get back to the most violent that we have seen appears to have been in Tunisia, which of course was one of the, the first of the Arab states, first North African state to throw off their dictator, their leader, followed by Egypt. Now, in Tunisia, we've seen many, many people taken to the streets to protest against what they see as the incompletion of um, 
of the revolution. It, they wanted not just the figurehead of the dictator out, they wanted the rest of the government out, and that's resulted in violent clashes in Tunisia, resulting in deaths there. Now, here in Cairo, a similar scene, a mass protest on Friday here at Tahir Square, which was the epicenter of the revolution that toppled Hanzi Mubarak. Now, protesters were back out there on Friday to call for the resignation, the standing down of key members of the cabinet who were um, former members of the Mubarak regime. Um, Ahmed Shafiq, the current prime minister, one person coming in for a lot of flack from the protesters. They want him to stand down. Now, those protesters were confronted by the military that uh, are currently policing Egypt at the moment. They were asked to tear down their, their tents that they were erecting and move on in the evening. They refused to do so. They were apparently asked again before the military returned at 2 a.m. on uh, Saturday morning here and fired shots in the air reportedly and then beat protesters with batons. So the, the military later apologized on their Facebook site, but this has caused some unrest and created quite an uneasy air here in Cairo. Okay, Peter, thanks very much indeed for uh, monitoring the situation for us there in the Middle East. Our correspondent Peter Oliver reporting from Cairo. And we've been gathering a wide range of perspectives on the crisis unfolding in North Africa and the Middle East. Political journalist Anthony Weil told RT that Western countries are advocating the spread of democracy across the region to control the politics of the Arab world. Western-style democracy in, in its current uh, state is far from what I would consider to be something that we should want uh, in any of these countries. I think, I think if there's going to be democracy, it should be democracy with a real change and a change that reflects democracy that actually benefits the people. Today's democracy is nothing more than a mainstream control mechanism through which the vast majority of the public who do not think are, are emotionally engaged in, uh, in, in situations that they don't even really realize what it is that they're voting for or approving. And if you think that democracy, which is supposedly what the U.S. is out there pushing and driving home for these people who, who need so much the philosophy of what they've developed and, and put together in, uh, in, the, in the U.S., for example, take a look at what, at what they're doing. I mean, building bases in hundreds of over 100 different countries, uh, you know, basically putting at the end of a gun the word democracy and shoving it down their throats. Uh, to me, this is not democracy. This is abuse. This is nothing more than a system that is doomed to failure. And as long as central banks continue to stand side by side in a democratic system like we have, printing endless amounts of fiat money, which is devalued by devaluing by the minute, uh, we're not going to have anything more here than chaos that is used to mask that devaluation process and hopefully distract people from the overall fraud that's been perpetrated on Western societies. If that's democracy, who'd want it? Dr. Manu Sheratakin, analyst at the Center for Global Energy Studies, believes fears of turmoil in Libya spreading across the region have caused the surge in oil prices. People in the financial market uh, have a fear. They look not at the present time that there is still sufficient oil in the uh, Mediterranean basin, let's say, uh, but they fear that this might expand and there will be disruption, etc., etc., and they think in a few weeks and a few months ahead. And the fear for that is what has caused the price go up. I think the basic behind it is the fear that there will be a disruption of the supply of oil. And so people who are in the market, they uh, bet and take positions for higher prices in order to cover themselves. They provide hedging. And if it is only confined to disruption from Libya, the world industry, the world market can manage it with a hiccup, with the uh, difficulty of, uh, and, uh, of, uh, of disruption for a few weeks or maybe a month.